So Intel's has dropped yet another enhancement to the ultra desktop CPUs called Intel 200S Boost Overclocking Profile. And essentially with just a single setting in the BIOS, it aims to increase the fabric die to die speeds and also memory frequencies. Although Intel recommends you use 8,000 mega transfers RAM, either UDIM or QDIM. But for this video, I'm gonna choose 7,000 mega transfers CL32, which is more of a balanced approach. But as Intel states in its hardware limit, section on this website. It says that not all memory modules are rated for the parameters of this program, so it could potentially limit the performance improvements we get out of this 200S boost. But again, I'm choosing it for a more balanced approach as 8000 mega transfers is obviously much more expensive. Intel also states that the 200S boost profile will not void the limited processor warranty provided by Intel. So at least that's a plus, I guess. And I've updated my Z 90 p to the latest BIOS, and obviously so you will need to as well if you want this improvement. And right off the bat, you can expect about a 1% improvement in average FPS at 1080p. So yeah, not so great, and it still falls behind the 9600X. And even the 245K doesn't really improve all that much, only by around 1%. And 720p doesn't do many favors either, just a 3% improvement overall on the 285K, but at least the 245K this time improves by upwards of 7%, which I thought was actually pretty interesting. And checking out individual games on just the 285K, like in Assassin's Creed Shadows at 1080p, we see minuscule improvements, with only a slight increase in 0.1% lows by around 9%. This game is pretty GPU limited though at 1080p, and in fact, dropping down to 720p paints a better picture with a 2% uptick in averages and 1% lows. However, this time, 0.1% lows drop by 5%, so it does come with a compromise. Age of Mythology though is quite the opposite, being extremely CPU limited due to the various characters and simulations on screen. And unfortunately at 1080p, performance overall suffers with the new boost active, losing 1-2% in averages and 1% lows, and suffering a 17% blow to 0.1% lows. And this remains true for 720p, although it's a little less hard hitting, with no improvements to averages, but a 6% uptick in 1% lows, but retains a 13% loss to 0.1% lows. So it's not so great in an extremely CPU limited game like this one. Next up is Black Ops 6, and at 1080p, it's not so promising either. Expect a performance regression in averages and 1% lows, but at least 0.1% lows uptick by around 4%. So it seems to switch back and forth between an improvement and a regression, especially in lows. But when we look at 720p, it really starts to highlight this. We see a 3% uptick in averages and an 8% improvement in 1% lows, but 0.1% lows drop by 8%. And this is unlike 1080p, with inconsistent behavior overall. And Far Cry 6 continues this trend with 1080p seeing a 1-3% uptick in averages and 1% lows, with a 5% regression and 0.1% lows. But this time at 720p, we see an improvement in all metrics, though it's nothing earth shattering, with a 6, 8 and 6% 6 uplift in averages, 1 and 0.1% lows. Though an improvement is an improvement, you have to give it that, but it really fails to move the needle overall. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is also a mixed bag, averages drop by 3%, but lows improve by 2-3% to at 1080p. And at 720p, it's all over the place, with regressions and averages and 0.1% lows, with a slight less than a percent uptick in 0.1% lows. F124, however, is a little more consequential. 1080p sees a 9-10% to improvement in averages and 1% lows, but 0.1% lows do drop a little. And 720p is a little more consistent, though the improvement overall drops, with only a 7% uptick in averages, but a 2-3% improvement in lows. And finally, we have CS2, which receives a minor improvement by less than a percent in averages at 1080p, with regressions in 1% lows, but a 3% uptick in 0.1% lows. Finally, at 720p, you can expect minimal improvements with a 1% uptick overall, with the biggest increase by 3% coming from those 0.1% lows. So does it do it any wonders for its performance per dollar? Well, not really. Like I said in my last 
last video. With current pricing, on paper the 285k is a better value than the 9950s 3D, and of course turning on 200s has marginally improved this, but if Intel is recommending faster RAM speeds of up to 8000 mega transfers coupled with 200s boost, if it makes any meaningful improvement, if at all, will substantially reduce this overall value because, you know, faster RAM does cost more. And the 9600x is also just a much better value than the 245k, even with 200s boost. And really the only reason the 9950x 3D is currently priced at 885 is really down to availability, not really tariffs. Although tariffs could affect it upon restocks. So you were right to point out in the comments in our last video when comparing these two. As such, when comparing MSRP or launch price, the 9950X 3D is just a better value overall, and Intel's new 200S boost doesn't really make a dent in its value. And even when comparing MSRP on the 245K with its 200S boost, it doesn't do much to justify itself when the 9600X exists. And lastly, comparing performance for what Surprisingly, the 285K becomes more efficient when enabling the new 200S boost, but the same cannot be said for the 245K, though only marginally decreases efficiency when enabling it. So the new 200S boost makes the 285K more efficient than the 9950S 3D, so I guess you could call that a win, but a bit of curve optimizer and PVO2 would make Intel's win pretty short-lived. And that's not even mentioning the 9800X 3D, which remains the efficiency king. So to wrap it all up, in my last video, I overemphasized the 285K's value on paper, especially when compared to that 9950S 3D. That was my mistake. With current pricing, sure, it looks like a better deal right now, but if the 9950X 3D were to ever return to its MSRP, it's undeniably the better value. And that context matters, and I should have been clear in that previous video. It's also worth noting that the 9950X costs upwards of $70 less than the 285K. And if the 9600X is anything to go by, we can safely expect the 9950X to outperform the 285K while offering nearly identical performance in multi-threading and productivity, which really makes it the stronger value proposition overall, especially when talking about upgradability and also the AM5 socket. Speaking of sockets, LJ1851, which is a socket for both the 285K and 245K, is only expected to last this generation and a refresh generation. And that wasn't clear at the time of the last video, but now we know that the new socket, LJ1954, is coming for the future generation Nova Lake CPUs. And that kind of short-lived platform support makes it incredibly hard to recommend investing in LJ1851 right now. And then of course we've got 200S it's just not a significant change to even care about. The improvements are all over the place, sometimes up, sometimes down, and the overall uplift is marginal at best. And it doesn't really shift the value equation in Intel's favor that much, especially when you consider the need for ultra high speed RAM to even attempt to make the most of it. So while the 285K looked good in theory, a deeper dive now with more context makes it harder to recommend. I appreciate all of you guys who mentioned these things out in the comments. This is how we keep discussions honest and also evolving on this channel. So if you did find this video helpful, drop a like, consider subscribing, and let me know your thoughts down below, especially if you've been testing any of these chips yourself. I'll catch you in the next one.